slides are is posted by Saulius um, or in the chat here. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Mi++ seminar. Today, Saulius uh, Grazulis from uh, Vilnius University, Institute of Biotechnology, will talk about the open crystallographic databases, actually several of them, starting from COD, Lantic COD, and there are even more sisters. Over to you, Saulius. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for this introduction and for kind invitation to participate in your uh, group seminar. I really find this amazing and, and very um, very enthusiastic about this. And let me tell you a bit um, broader about our work, which we do at the Vilnius University, uh, crystallography and chemical informatics group, and about databases, which we provide to all community, which might be helpful to you as well. Um, so my talk will be uh, consist of four parts. I first will start with broader perspective on the value of data and crystallographic data in particular. Then I introduce the uh, four databases with the main focus of, on the COD. The others are built according to the same pattern and mention some other databases by our colleagues as well. Then I will briefly discuss what applications these databases do have and can have. And then, since I understand you are a mathematical group, I would like to you know, discuss some mathematical considerations uh, in crystal data processing, how we do that, what problems we encounter, and maybe this will lead to a discussion further. So let's start with the first topic, and I would like to start from a bit uh, broader perspective and, and farther distance. Uh, data have been important as far back as in ancient Greece, and for me, a very impressive use of, uh, you know, data and measurements was were that those of Hipparchus in the second century before current era, where he measured culmination times of several bright stars and compared these measurements with those done um, of his, by his predecessors. And his predecessors lived something like 100 years ago, okay? So they had ways to make reliable measurements, uh, accurate enough to be comparable and to preserve these over, you know, uh, 100 years and more. And he found systematic differences in these measurements and discovered the precession of equinoxes, we now know as precession of Earth rotation axis. And at that time, that was very impressive for, for com contemporary. So, okay. so th this just shows that we can use data and data can be very important. And of course, in the 21st century, we have uh, a lot more possibilities using digital computers to draw inferences from data. But uh, in many cases, data are published uh, together with papers and most results actually are published as human readable texts and they are not quite ready for uh, computer applications for, compu for high throughput processing. So different approaches can be used. So for example, here, people from Japan, uh, from the Starry Data Group, um, uh, the references here, they go through publications in material science and extract data that is encoded in tables and graphs. Data are not copyrighted and they put it into compute in a computer usable form. And when we do this, we can immediately see an, uh, an, an overview of a large number of data points. And for example, they report that they discovered, for example, some parameters like thermoelectric constants vary quite a lot in reported measurements by two orders of magnitude here in this graph, whereas the theoretical <clears throat> estimate was that this should be constant for, for, for these types of materials. So again, having all data in one place is a benefit, but takes a lot of work to extract it. Now in crystallography, we are more lucky or, or than this. Here, data are from day zero put into 
computer managed databases and organized in a computer readable form. And the most paradigmatic database in that field is the Protein Data Bank, which you probably know. It's managed by an umbrella consortium that uh, um, brings together three sites that host the same data in Europe, in the United States, and in Japan. And the data is fully open access under public domain license, so everybody can benefit of uh, it. And this gave rise to actually a new um, branch of science, I would say, bioinformatics, okay? structural bioinformatics. Okay? Now, we try to replicate the same for chemical crystallography by creating crystallography open database that is governed, governed under the same principles. And we also make crystallographic data for chemical crystallography and mineral crystallography crystallography available openly. And of course, there are many other initiatives and databases in crystallography. I would like to mention Bill Baum Magnetic Structure Database. They have also a commensurate structure database. So if you are after some interesting crystallographic artifacts in, in, or interesting crystallographic data sets, you might want to examine this. Now, I must mention that for chemical crystallography, uh, there are many databases which are larger than ours and, and older than ours, but they are distributed under proprietor licenses. And in some cases, these licenses even forbid you to openly disseminate the drive data from their database. So uh, I and my colleagues, we think that this is not appropriate for the 21st century. First, it's technically very limiting. And second, uh, we claim that access to data is a fundamental human right uh, if data were obtained by publicly funded research. So why should it be under, behind the paywall? We should, we have right to access that. Okay. And the estimate Samuels, is... Uh, yeah. Could I ask a quick question here? Yeah, sure, um, please go ahead. Yeah, probably not everyone knows uh, every acronym here on the slides. Could you remind us about PDF, which might have different meanings? Oh, I see. Okay, sorry for that. So PDF is powder diffraction file. It's a database that uh, summarizes uh, X-ray and neutron scattering data from mm, powder samples. And it was originally conceived as a way to identify materials and to do a sort of chemical analysis by crystallography. Started uh, actually in, in 1940 something as a paper card, so called Hannawald cards, probably, if I pronounce the name correctly. So you could take a diffractogram and look at these cards at the most intense peaks. It's, identify what material you had at hand. And now, of course, this is automated and done using computers. ICSD is uh, inorganic crystal structure database. Well, costs in organic crystals, as it says. And CCDC is a Cambridge crystallographic data center that has several products. And the, they started with, as far as I know, and the most prominent their database is CSD, Cambridge Structural Database, which we might have access to and use. And currently, they also contain structures from um, ICSD, as far as I know. Now, polling file is a manually curated material structure and property database done by Swiss scientists. Um, um, I forgot forgot the name. Will not will not cite the name. But um, so I, I'm sure if you Google these names, you will get the references. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's go on. <clears throat> so my estimate is that uh, there is more than one million, less than ten million crystal structures available out there in different stages of publication. Different stages meaning that some are published in papers and deposited in databases, but some. Uh, but some structures sit in drawers of scientists and wait for their time to be let out of there. So uh, few people, or if, if, if any, have access to this. And the idea is to organize these structures openly. 
And when we do that, then real breakthroughs in science happens. And this is an example which you for sure know, um, you know the AlphaFold neural network machine learning model enables us now today to predict protein structures from the primary sequence alone and does this for natural proteins with very high accuracy. So finally, people try to do this for probably like 100 years or so, maybe less since, since the sequences started coming in large amount at least. And this is finally a solution, a practical solution to this problem. And as they state in their paper, their models were trained on data extracted from the PDB, the protein data bank. So open databases are very instrumental and necessary for the um, new scientific discoveries and new scientific methods. Okay, so let's now go to the crystallographic databases that we are building, the COD, TCOD, PCOD, and other related databases. So first of all, how this all started, uh, COD is a grassroots project. And in 2003, crystallographers from different places in the world came together in a mailing list and asked uh, Michael Berndt, who's, who's unfortunately no longer with us, uh, but um, he posed these three questions. So can we do an open database by just pooling the efforts of scientists together? and you know, bringing together our data using open source software and cheap commodity hardware. And I, why I cite this, that now I look from 2023, you know, 20 years later, uh, we can attest that all these things happened. Actually. So we have a um, community that builds, that brings together data. We have uh, an open database, which is, operates on open source principles. So meet the crystallography open database. It is available online under the URL uh, mentioned above. And if you download the slides, all URLs and all citations should be clickable here. Uh, it hosts inorganic, uh, metal organic, and uh, small organic molecule crystal data in machine readable form. The license is CC0, and as of current date, we have over slightly over half a million records. Uh, this doesn't mean unique structures. There are some uh, legitimate and an accidental, very few accidental duplicates in there, but the number of that records is this. Uh, as mentioned, several types of materials are covered in our database. And um, we also collect data registers by different methods. It can be X-ray single crystal diffraction. It can be powder diffraction, provided people determine atomic coordinates using Ritual refinement or similar techniques. Uh, and uh, it can have neutron or electron diffraction uh, structures. Um, it, the, the main, uh, so to say, unifying um, concept is that there must be a crystalline sample, an ordered um, solid state sample that is adequately described by a single crystal model and by atomic coordinates placed in, in the unit cell, right? Okay, so now the sisters, um, uh, the, actually the success of the crystallography open database and the growing amount of data inspired us to build other databases which are built according to similar principles and which even reuse some of the software that was originally designed for the COD. So the, the first, <clears throat> most, the closest uh, friend, the closest database is the TCOD or theoretical crystallography open database, where we decided to put published uh, theoretically calculated DFT using DFT methods or molecular dynamic methods uh, crystal structures. 
Okay, so the, the crystallography open database, by the way, is governed by the advisor report, the scientists, crystallographers throughout the world who dedicate their time and um, who take decisions on scientific content and procedures of the database. So it was decided that uh, the theoretical structures have different ontological status uh, compared to experimental ones, and they should go into a separate database so that, you know, making inferences for our users would be easier. Um, um, sure, you can filter uh, these data out, but having them separately is easy. Then there is a PCOD, a predicted crystallography, crystal structure database. Um, it is uh, mainly uh, formed by data of Armel Labai, one of the co-founders of the crystallography open database and his colleagues. And these data are built using uh, high throughput molecular dynamic and combinatorial calculations uh, that generated, as you see, a lot uh, over a million of theoretical crystal structures. Uh, some of them can indeed be found that later in experiments, and I will show you one citation of that, but not all of them are 100% sure. Well, you, never, you are never 100% sure, but not, of, not all of them have the same reliability as, um, uh, as the ones in the other databases, I would say. So it, again, it makes sense to have these predictions separately. Now, an interesting database, if you look after experimental properties of crystals, not only their structures, is the MPOD, Material Properties Open Database. It is currently, um, it is currently maintained in Mexico by the scientist team there. And it contains, not so many records, but these records were actually manually collected from the literature in the way similar like stereo data collect um, graph data from publications. And they have correspondences to the structures in the crystallography open database. So if you are after comparing crystal structure and property, uh, property crystal structures with properties and working out structure property relations, then you might want to use to look into this database as well. And recently we have applied the, the same organization principles to other disciplines, for example, to Raman spectroscopy. And we also made a, a Raman open database uh, for our, our, for the European Horizon project in which we participated. Um, and again, it turns out to be perfectly workable um, to organize an open database according to the same principles as the COD. And that database contains Raman spectra, as its name says. And these Raman spectra are again linked to crystal structures. So you can have crystal structure and both measured and sometimes calculated spectrum of the material. And below are the references to, to the publications about these databases. OK, let's move on. Now, <clears throat> to enable this high scale data collection and preservation, of course, we need a reliable data presentation standard. And here we crystallographers are very lucky because interna the International Union of Crystallography, since actually yeah, three decades by now, is developing and quite successfully developing a framework called Crystallographic Interchange Framework. This is a file format and a set of dictionaries uh, that enables crystallographers to uh, encode the information, represent their crystal structures in a standard way, which all software, all crystal labs understand in the same way. And it allows us to exchange data, it allows us to archive data and to publish data. Okay, and it's the standard is maintained by ICR, so it's ideally suitable for organizing such crystallographic uh, data collections. Okay, and I would like, since it's, it's a key thing 
uh, CIF, I think, is a key component to both build a database and use a database. I would like to go a little bit deeper into how this how these files look like. So you might have already seen uh, some of the files. And if you look into such file, you will realize that it's a text file where different data items are described by specifying a keyboard and then giving a value to that keyboard. Um, uh, despite being a human readable file, this uh, uh, this file has a very well defined, mathematically defined structure. There is an, a grammar for it expressed in Bacchus now form. So we can write parses for these files and indeed many parses exist out there. And then the data can be read in unambiguously and processed and all values can be found uh, in every zip file, no matter what software produced that file or what was the source of that file, the, what database produced it. Okay, and this is the example how atomic coordinates are encoded in that file. Uh, for small molecules, my default fractional coordinates are used. So these numbers, X, Y, Z, are actually fractions of unit cell edges. Um, and, but there is also a possibility to use Cartesian coordinates using the different data names. All these data names, their meaning and interpretation is described in so-called CIF dictionaries that are also maintained either by ICR themselves and in, in by CONCIF, Committee for CIF Development, or by corresponding communities, for example, a modulated structure community, you know, symmetry processing community, um, and, and other you know, communities of crystallographers. Uh, actually, the system, the CIF system is open, which is also a very good feature of it. Anybody can write a dictionary and offer it to the community, to, to, the, to the users, to scientists. They can start use them, that new dictionary themselves. And if that um, uh, set of data names that are declared in that dictionary becomes widespread, then IUCR allows you to register a prefix for a data name, for example, uh, underscore myth underscore if that would be your group or in our case it's underscore cod underscore and we then can issue our own data names needed for processing and housekeeping purposes in the database and we can make sure that these databases do not uh, these data names do not conflict with uh, the names issued by other groups so that you find a very good organization um, the files themselves, if you look carefully at them, they are themselves the CIF files. They are themselves in CIF syntax. And so you can build a parser, read in the data, and you can validate the CIF file, the data file. For example, you can uh, make sure that all cell lengths are, in fact, numbers, and they can have an, an estimated standard deviation or estimated standard uncertainty of the measurement, and they must be positive. It also says the units which are used for measurements, they are fixed for all files to be the same. And then there is a human readable description of that file. There is a, a further development of the CIF framework that allows also computer interpretable definitions of data items, but I will not get deep into that now. Just would like to mention that such possibilities exist and it's an active development. Okay. Saulius. Yeah. Uh, could ask a quick question about, sure. um, yes, um, about <clears throat> the precision. Uh, yeah. For example, in C files from the Cambridge Structural Database, uh, all uh, geometric parameters are usually given, uh, I think we have three decimal places in angstroms. Mm -hmm. after the dot. Mm -hmm. How about a uh, crystallography open database? Well, we provide uh, numeric values in exactly that form in which authors provided them, mm -hmm. unless there is serious reason to create data and to do otherwise. So here you can see actually the example of such records mm -hmm. taken from the existing 
uh, structure in our database. Uh, in this case, indeed, three decimal places, but not of Cartesians, uh, uh, instead uh, of fractional coordinates are provided. Now, this is uncertainty in the last digit, a usual notation even in print, and this is the standard, also standardized in CIF. So it's plus minus 0 0.003 to this value. Now, as we see, this value has four decimal places and slightly higher precision. And modern software, if you have enough data, does a full uh, matrix least square refinement. So you can, from the variance covariance matrix, you can extract uh, precisions of all parameters that you refine. Now, these parameters here are just one digit and they're just one half, and they are assumed to be exact because this is a special position. The titanium sits in, on the half half the unit cell. So no matter, you, you just don't refine that parameter. You assume from crystal symmetry that the atom is there and all uncertainty goes into um, cell parameters that are refined separately and also have their codes. A bit long, but to, did I answer your question? Yes, yeah, thank you very much. And actually, when we calculate uh, uh, Cartesian coordinates from these data, so you cell constants and uh, the provided coordinates, fractional coordinates, and you can do propagation of uncertainties, so that actually works quite fine, and you can get estimates on errors in Cartesians. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. The code is not just a, a dump of input files. We So how we process data, we take the published structure or the structure that uh, crystallographers uploaded to our website themselves. And then we parse the data, extract the data values from it. And we, and we uh, form another CIF with exactly those data that we recognize in that CIF file, okay? And doing so enables us to strictly stick to IOCR standards. So we guarantee that all files are syntactically correct and correspond to CIF, um, um, CIF grammar. Uh, so we, of course, can read them with no problem if it's a correct parser, mm -hmm. okay? And then we try to stick to uh, um, ICR dictionaries and to uh, the you know, data interpretation that is uh, mandated by ICR. We try to not invent data. So as said, we leave exactly the same values as people have put into files, unless we have real evidence that data must be different. For example, the paper says the coordinate is uh, has one value and the CIF file says it has another value and the value in the CIF uh, contradicts our chemical and crystallographic knowledge, then we might correct that value based on the author's the report in their paper. Mm, or uh, And we say that it's better to have no data than have wrong data. So if data values uh, cannot be corrected and they are obviously wrong. So uh, the criterion is if we see that a reader that the reader of the paper uh, cannot reasonably interpret that value and use it, then we regard this as incorrect and useless and we might remove it from subsequent revisions of the crystallography of the database, but we will not try to reinterpret it in our own way. As said, we consult original papers or even write authors themselves. And in, in many cases, we get uh, very useful answers. And this helps us to improve quality of, the, uh, of our data set. Uh, we record and explain all changes that we made to the records. And all our changes that happened since the original publication, since the ingestion of the original publication record are kept in the version control system. So you can go through and see precisely what changes were made. 
And also we can always reconstruct the previous data stream bit to bit if there is a need to do so. So you can always uh, check uh, um, the, what the exact changes were. And you can also always reproduce your old computations if you use our database. So I think it's very important for scientific use. Uh, and we also keep as much as possible the data provenance where the files came from. So of course we have all the references, bibliographed references to original data, and we have original uh, file names. Unfortunately, the supplementary material um, data files can change their names without notice. So tracking them back is not fully automatic, but at least we do the best we is possible. As said, um, SIF data can be checked on different levels of uh, description. And it seems that in, in all data processing tasks, three levels of validation or two, three levels of data checking are uh, present. So first of all, we do syntactic checks. And for this, we have a special error correcting parser that when it ingests data, and uh, tries to correct the most common discrepancies, which were unfortunately rather common in the early days of CIF application. And even today, every now and when there is a CIF file that doesn't strictly conform to the syntax. So the uh, error correcting parser published by uh, uh, by us to get that is my colleague working in my group. So um, this parse allows us to save human work and ingest the data without losing information in that, in, in that data set. Later, we can manually correct if the initial guess of syntax was wrong. Okay, so this is, and after that, we when we ingest that data, we make sure that all output data are syntactically correct not necessarily semantically correct. To do that, we do extra validation steps. Semantic validation can be done against ICR dictionaries. As I've mentioned, they are also encoded in SIF format. They have description of data items. And so we can, <clears throat> um, um, another my colleague and Panos Vaitkos made a tool, a validation tool that can go through all our collection and see if uh, the values there they are correspond to sub dictionaries. And finally, we when we put a new data record into a database, we do so-called what we call what I call um, area specific or subject area specific checks. In this case, we check against uh, limit values provided by the International Union of Crystallography in their requirements for the authors. And if it's um, personal communication or uh, pre-publication structure, which crystallographers also can deposit with us, then uh, if certain quality indicators are not satisfied, we ask authors uh, what's the reason for that and if that can be improved. Uh, and, and usually this um, can be improved or can be documented at least why this is so. And uh, if this is... Um, published structure, then of course it has been peer reviewed already. So we pr put it as is, but we can uh, see if these values uh, correspond to the necessary limit. So basically three uh, tiers of checking syntax, formal semantic validations and application subject area specific tests. Okay, and this is the example of uh, the recent data creation event. In case you are curious, what what could be the changes, or what changes could be necessary for for a published structure? Here, for example, we ingest um, structure of a mineral into our database, and our source, which is an American crystallographer uh, crystal structure database, they share their data with us. Have that database has mm, their own specific. Uh, agreements how to encode atom chemical types, customer with mineralogists. So for example, if you see an atom called what, what, you need to know that this is water. 
okay? But uh, the standard SIF software doesn't have this knowledge. So uh, to circumvent this, to make sure that these files are processable by uh, every program that reads SIF, we add special data names, atom site type symbol, which gives the chemical type of that atom. And we also uh, have a special data name that allows us to specify how many hydrogens are attached to that atom. Hydrogens are not always explicitly seen in the, uh, in the data sets, uh, in, in crystallographic data. They, they scatter too little of x-rays. But from chemistry and mineralogists from, from the mineral uh, structure, they know where water or hydro hydroxyl radicals are. So we can interpret this and put the number of attached hydrogens. And with that change... Carlos, uh, could yeah. clarify it? So this what uh, refers uh, to oxygen atom in a water molecule? Indeed. Mm -hmm. So this is an oxygen atom, and we know that since this is water, we know that there are two more hydrogens attached to it. Uh -huh. So it's not six, but eight electrons at that point. But we don't know exactly where these hydrogens are. Okay. And maybe they are even disordered, so the water molecule can rotate on that side. Mm -hmm. And in so X-ray data... necessarily all hydrogen positions are specified. Well, in some cases they are, especially for organics. Mm -hmm. For some techniques, hydrogens are very well visible. For example, in neutron diffractions, hydrogens are very strong scatterers. Moreover, you have deuterium, then the scattering phase is flipped opposite. So it can distinguish deuterium from hydrogen, but you need a neutron source for that. Mm -hmm. And it's much more challenging experiment because the scattering is weaker. So depending on the technique, you might have one information or another in the data record. Okay, thank you. Okay, now how, how can you access the database? Mm. Oh, would you, would you like more, ask more questions? Oh. Shall I continue? Yeah, please continue. Okay. Yeah. okay, let's go. So how can you access the database? Well, we have several ways to access the database. First of all, we can use the web, uh, portal that we have, that's for quick um, uh, access, which does not require installation of any software. Um, uh, also there you will find instructions how to fetch the whole database using either version control system, subversion or our sync protocol so that you can have it on your local disk. Then you can use a REST interface to access um, uh, either individual records or uh, conduct searches. And these are clickable links that lead to the corresponding pages. Uh, we assign stable identifiers, of course, as, uh, which uniquely identify crystal structure solution instance. Okay? Together with the version number, you get a unique stream of bytes. And without version number, you will get the latest curated revision of that record. Okay? And we also have um, um, some quick search table in SQL, and we allow people to use anonymous um, SQL select queries using Code Reader. Um, so basically, you can run all these commands or click these links and access the COD right now. I hope it will survive the, uh, the, the all queries. Okay, uh, but of course, um, when you are consulting multiple databases, ours is not the, the, the only one, and each database has their own REST interface, then uh, you have really problems and, and need to do a lot of work to get data from different sources, okay? So recently, uh, material scientists came together uh, maintainers of different databases came together and um, uh, we also participate there and we created an interface, a RESTful stun interface standard called Optimate, okay, published in 21, 
And this standard allows you to query any compliant database using exactly the same syntax and get answers in exactly the same way, including answers containing atomic coordinates. Okay, Crystallography Open Database also contain, implements uh, Optimate, this version one, and uh, we are working together with the consortium to also develop and implement the next versions of the uh, interface. So you may want to use that as well. Okay, so now quickly, I see that I'm running out of time, <laughs> but um, the applications, well, crystallographic databases have really a lot of applications and my sort of say philosophical justification, or scientific justification, why these data are so valuable is that every observation that you do in in the world must be compatible with the atomic coordinates in the crystal structure model. If they are not, then something is wrong. Either your crystal structure is wrong or your observation was wrong. You, you saw something else, but they need to be compatible. So crystal structures, I would claim, have enormous predictive power. Uh, and it's it's not um, um, you know strange that People use crystal structures for also crystal property predictions, material identifications, and similar tasks. And here, uh, uh, Armel Lobai, one of the co-founders of the Crystallography Open Database, and <clears throat> the author of PCOD Database, uh, he shows an, an example of material identification using his predicted structures there. So the black curves are x-ray traces of a real sample and the red bars are predicted scattering positions from the atomic models and you see that they coincide quite well especially given that this is a theoretical structure and this phase then can, could be identified to correspond to that structure and of course you can do the same for experimental structures from the cod and for the theoretical DFT calculated structures from the T card. And uh, this is how modern technology enables chemists and crystallographers to identify as materials quickly. Uh, the large uh, vendors of crystallographic equipment like Brooker, Panalytical, um, Rigaku, they use among other databases also the COD uh, to ship it with their different parameters so that the users can do material identification. What else can we do? Well, when you have uh, atomic positions in the crystal, then you can ask what chemistry is there uh, in the, um, what chemical molecule is there. And though we see atomic positions, we don't have many other chemical information, for example, we don't know what the bond types are uh, and what the charges of the atoms are. So we have recently wrote a software, uh, again, Antana Svetkus is the author of the software, and uh, build a database where we ask ourselves, what is the chemical repertoire of the molecules that we have in the crystallography open database? And um, we, we are now no, the paper is under review, and basically we now know and we have reported all chemical moieties that you can find in our crystal. So you can not only search by crystal parameters, but also um, search by chemistry and find the molecules you're interested in. And this allows us to link uh, the COD crystals to the chemical identifiers like SMILES or INCHI. And with this, we could put a lot of over 200,000 records into the open resource PubChem, where you now can query for chemical properties and um, reactions involving those molecules that you find in COD. And vice versa, if you have a molecule and the crystals in the COD, you can find the crystal structure from here. And conveniently, they show where our database is located. <laughs> okay, and this is an example how the crystal structure page or oh, so chemical 
description page in Kotham looks for material from the crystallography database. Okay, another interesting feature of crystals is that sometimes you have infinite nets of covalent bonds presented in the crystals, or you could have infinite nets of metal of coordination bonds, metal with organic ligands. Uh, for example, the famous MOFs metal organic frameworks uh, built in that way. So we also started catalog uh, building a catalog of all these infinite nets and also look which ones interpenetrate each other, which ones could be exfoliated in a parallel. Uh, here uh, I present some intermediate results of one of my former students, Alina Belova, and now another person is, work, is continuing this work. Um, and for example, you can find some nets, some case crystals where two dimensional layers of uh, connected atoms are uh, penetrated by one dimensional chains of the same, uh, and of, this, of, the, of the similar materials. And we would like to catalog this and make searchable. I must uh, tell here that uh, Blatov from Samara University, he does a lot of work on that, and Delgado Friedrich published a lot, Aeon published a lot, so we are reading now into these papers and look what we can apply to our database and, and what can we do. And the interesting question, which I couldn't find answer uh, in, in, the, in the published literature, maybe, maybe didn't understood quite well, but um, so when you have parallel layers of two-dimensional nets, two situations are possible. Either these um, nets are not linked together, so you can just separate them without breaking covalent bonds. That would be one situation. Or like in graph uh, graphite, you have graphene layers placed on each other. But the other possibility is that the two layers are knitted together. They don't have covalent bonds but they interpenetrate each other infinitely many times and form sort of knots. And uh, I don't know how to, algorith to algorithmically detect that. That would be an interesting thing to do. Um, you could also ask, are there actually uh, finite net molecules that are linked together that form knots or, or links and again, we try to look into that, and we have some algorithms, um, some some programs that calculate um, uh, knot invariance on our structures. And uh, for example, we can distinguish the structure on the left with the link number zero, the unknot, and the structure in the right, which is um, um, a hop link, right? And the idea is, and there are actually molecules that form knots or that form links, the so-called catenans, and it would be very interesting to be able to find them automatically in our crystals. And although, the, uh, as far as I know, the knot and brine problem is not yet solved completely, maybe mathematicians are uh, close to doing that, but even though this is not solved, Molecular knots are very simple, so they usually have low crossing numbers, and I think the existing invariants will be enough if we use several of them. They might be enough to uniquely identify what not, what not of the simple kind does the molecule form. So that would be an interesting thing to do. Okay, so and, and mathematical considerations now. So how much do I have? Like, Close to 50 minutes. Well, formally 10 minutes, but uh, we could overrun a little bit. Okay. So I'll, I think I'll definitely fit into so it's 30 to, uh, to, to 45, and th there is a lot of references there. So I definitely fit in 10, maybe I fit in 5. More. Okay. Thanks. So actually, the knots already started some of mathematical. Um, discussing theorems, mathematical theorems that could be applied to crystal structures. But there is also very interesting, uh, interesting to me, 
area of crystal symmetry and crystal symmetry application. And it's very important for practical processing of crystal data, because if you look into a um, crystal structure, like I've showed here, you will see that uh, some molecules are not represented in whole. Uh, there is just a half of or a part of the molecule in the, the file. And this is because the crystallographers only describe the so-called symmetric unit of the crystal. And then you need to apply crystal symmetry operations that reconstruct the remaining part of the chemically connected atom net, or the molecular entity, as we call it. So if we apply that rule to the structure on the left, we have the structure on the right. But now we have a different problem because, or well, I see it as a problem at least, uh, because now in the original structure, you have one sulfur per one nitrogen, clearly. And also the groups are charged, the sulfur, uh, sulfonic acid is negatively charged and the amino group is positively charged. So there is a charge balance and the crystal is of course neutral. But now in this model, you have two negative charge and two sulfurs per one positively charged nitrogen. So some information is lost when you go from the left description to the right description. And so we thought, how can we provide uh, what we call a stoichiometrically correct uh, uh, molecular ensembles where all atoms are represented in the same ratios as they are in the original crystal. Okay, then you could use these the set of molecules uh, to investigate the, further the properties of the crystal because they would contain this same information just possibly in more convenient form. And we came up with the following algorithm. Uh, so first of all, find a symmetry group of each uh, molecule, and it's a subgroup of a symmetry group of the crystal itself. And here by symmetry group, I, I don't take translations in account. So we actually take the full symmetry group of the crystal and factorize it by translation group. Of, of that the crystal, that every crystal has. And then we get a finite group, one of the 230 space groups. And this uh, we regard then as a, a, a symmetry group of the of a space group of the crystal. So the symmetry group of the molecule is a subgroup of, of that crystal. It must be because atoms are reconstructed by crystal symmetry operators. Now, when we get a whole molecular assembly, it, it also has a symmetry group. Uh, we can determine the symmetry group by just multiplying together symmetry operators of the, of the uh, corresponding molecules. So in this case, the um, uh, naphthalene uh, disulf uh, um, disulfonic acid, that should be the proper chemical name, um, that molecule is re restored by an inversion center. Okay? So inversion center must belong to the symmetry group of the whole molecular ensemble, but clearly it's not a symmetry element of the, the positively charged cation. Okay? Um, so we so, so multiply together all, uh, all symmetry elements of the crystals. And then we take a symmetry group of each molecule and we say, well, what are the cosets? Uh, it's a subgroup of the symmetry of the molecular ensemble. And we ask, what are the cosets? And from each coset, we take a distinct symmetry element and apply to a molecule to which is, has not yet been applied. And each, which element, which symmetry element we choose from a coset, in this case, it doesn't matter because uh, each of them will generate a symmetry equivalent molecule, which is as good in the crystal as any other. So we can choose whatever we want on maybe using different considerations, such as proximity to our 
molecular ensemble. And if we do that, the algorithm indeed works. So if the original, our usual algorithm that restores four molecules just give us one <laughs> naphthalene sulfonic acid, one amine and one water, then applying the algorithm which we suggested gives us two cations per one anion. The charge is balanced uh, again, and also we see that we have two waters. Okay, and this we have published a couple of years ago, quite a while ago. So we can now use this algorithm to reconstruct uh, molecular ensembles in every crystal. And for example, we can now ask, and we would like to ask question, if there is an inversion center or a mirror plane in the crystal and our molecule is not the same as its mirror images, then, or it is one of the different enantiomers, then sure, the crystal is a racemic one and the opposite enantiomer, the other enantiomer is um, present in the crystal. And now we can mathematically write an expression that will detect all these all, all these situations. So we can now ask ourselves how many uh, chiral molecules crystallize as enantiomers, uh, as resumes, how much are present in an antiopure form. This is important for drug design, for uh, evaluating biological activities and uh, um, for similar questions. And uh, also, it can be a different situation where both enantiomers okay, or enantiomorphs are present in the symmetric unit. They are not related by crystallographic symmetry. Uh, this can also be detected and should be detected, but in a different way. Okay. Now, when you process crystal data, and now I'm uh, uh, approaching my final set of of, of slides, of structures, you need to take in care into account that not all structures, not all crystals are perfectly ordered. And crystallographers do see disorder in many crystals. Uh, it manifests itself as the same atoms seen in several positions in the human cell. And they model this disorder appropriately a crystallographic entity framework that CIV has special provisions, special data names to describe this disorder. And we need to take it into account when we reconstruct uh, chemically plausible molecules or we use crystal structures for further calculations, geometric or quantum mechanics or whatever. So as we see in this structure, the methyl group is disordered and its hydrogens are uh, represented in two different sets, okay, of hydrogens. Now, not, not is it just disordered, it's disordered around special positions, so basically a mirror plane or glide plane runs here through that molecule. And so if you apply all symmetry operators in uh, of the crystal to the atom set, you get a picture like this, and clearly you have too many hydrogens, too many atoms you know, than in, in your reconstructed molecule. That, that's no good. Now, one of the first instincts, which we did and other people did, is to say that if a group is disordered around a special position, we just ignore symmetry operators for that group and keep it in the place where it was reported in the original crystal. But now, if you look at these carbons, they're bare carbons. They don't have any hydrogens left, which is also not correct, OK? Mm -hmm. So we thought, can we do this algorithmically? And uh, the idea was to apply the similar algorithm as we use for reconstructing sty stoichiometrically correct sets of atoms. and. <clears throat> When we do this, now you indeed see that these atoms, the, the, the hydrogens, are in correct places in correct amounts. And the algorithm, um, I cited it once more. And when you look at the slides, you will see that it's similar to the molecular reconstruction 
algorithm, but it's uh, but it's slightly different. So again, we find a symmetry group of a special position on which the disordered group rests. Okay, unfortunately, the current uh, data specification doesn't give us the information which particular which special position um, uh, does the group is the group disordered around. We need to estimate it from the geometry of the molecule. But it turns out that we can do this, which is apply all symmetry operators and see under which symmetry operator does the image clash with the original one. When it clashes, then it's clearly a disorder operator. Okay, and uh, I've recently learned that mathematician call this um, uh, symmetry group of a special position a stabilizer. So essentially it's a subgroup of the symmetry group and each element of that subgroup leaves the original point um, unmoved, okay, the, the special position point. And now we take this whole space group and again, we decompose it into cosets um, by the stabilizer group. Then we take one symmetry element from each coset and apply it to the disordered group atoms. And this gives us a one exemplar, one instance of the one instance of the um, of this uh, atom disordered atom set. In this case, however, so for molecules, it was it wouldn't matter which operator from the coset operation from the coset we take. But here we would get a different structure, but that structure would also represent a different state of the disorders crystal. Okay, so uh, I think I'm already one minute over an hour. Okay, so let's quickly show you how these um, these um, structures look like when you apply different operators. This slide shows that. It's indeed essential that we uh, multiply all atoms that are disorders because here we have this um, the, this condensed ring system that actually connects two sets of uh, molecules and builds an infinite framework. It's a metal organic framework. If we don't apply these operators, then the network is disrupted and we have a wrong net structure. If we apply all operators, then the molecules, as you see, overlap where they shouldn't. But if we apply uh, just a one operator from a corset, we get different possible conformations of each molecule. And now we clearly see that this is an infinite net. And let me now uh, go to a um, picture on the uh, on the web and see uh, see the video. Each frame in this video is a different conformation that could be present in the crystal if we take different sets of symmetry um, uh, operators into account. So basically, if you imagine we are moving along the unit cells of the crystal and look at each unit cell in turn and this flipping moieties just represent what could what different conformations could be. So for example, if we would like to do to make a super cell to take all this disorder into account, we would need to take different um, different instances, different unit cells. Um, that would I would say. Okay, and Okay, and with that, I just want to summarize the conclusions. So I think data are as important as publications and nowadays probably even more uh, important. They allow us to do discoveries if they're properly organized, caught, t caught, and other databases are to your disposal. I mostly uh, described code, but t caught and p caught, they have the same interface. So if you try to get data from there, all the instructions apply. 
uh, I think mathematical insights uh, are very important to get the data processing right. And yeah, let's share data, it's beneficial to all of us. I thank a lot of collaborators whom I am greatly indebted to, uh, and, and I had the pleasure and privilege to work with them. I acknowledge our funding sources and thank you for your attention. And just uh, the next couple of slides contain all references, all clickable to the papers, which I have mentioned in my slides. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Saulius. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, let me stop the recording and then